Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Bergen. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, really delighted to have Xavier Cronin here today. Uh, he wrote a book about uh, the road between Kabul and Kandahar uh, for the Louis Berger Group in 2010. He's written other books, <coughs> Grave Exodus and Our Appliances. He's currently an editor and writer with Petrochem Wire. Um, he's writing a novel, uh, and he will talk about the story of the rebuilding of Highway 1 from Kabul to Kandahar, and then sort of t t a broader take on what are the, you know, the kind of whole infrastructure story in Afghanistan, what is the, the tens of billions of dollars that have been spent there uh, really bought us. Um, so he's going to speak for about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, I'll uh, submit him to some Q&A, and then we'll open it to you guys. And uh, over to you, Xavier. Thanks a lot, Peter. And thanks a lot to the New America Foundation for inviting me to talk about this remarkable uh, post 9-11 story, which I um, wrote about in this book for Lewis Berger Group. Um, the story is really uh, several different stories. And with all that has happened since 9-11, it hasn't received a lot of attention um, for obvious reasons. I mean, there's been many, many books written, as you know, and 9-11 was a, a huge uh, event of historic proportions. But this particular um, story uh, is about, on one level, the rebuilding of Afghanistan's major highway, Highway 1. If you look on the map from Kabul to Kandahar, 300 miles. Uh, part of the, you may have heard of the Ring Road of Afghanistan that circles the country. Um, uh, under orders, the rebuilding, the road was completely devastated from the Soviet war and then the Taliban rule in the 1990s. Um, it was built in the 1960s by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So after 9-11, uh, the Bush administration um, wanted to have a signature project to show that we were making a lot of progress in the rebuilding of Afghanistan, as, of course, we were planning to go into Iraq and invade Ara uh, Iraq. And so they decided, after consulting with Karzai and his people and various people in the U.S. government, that the signature project would be rebuilding Highway 1. And so it's really the story of how uh, the, the highway was rebuilt in a very short time frame because um, the U.S. Agency for International Development, I know we have a few people uh, here from that agency, USAID, they got um, the orders to uh, do a lot of reconstruction in Afghanistan and uh, specifically get this road built. Um, they, in turn, awarded a contract in September of 2002 to the Lewis Berger Group, which uh, I know there's uh, several Lewis Berger people here, and they uh, do a lot of USAID work uh, all over the world. And the US, um, so the AID gave uh, the Lewis Berger Group this contract uh, to rebuild schools and, and roads and highways. So um, what happened in 2000, two is they got the contract and they started work on the rebuilding of the road. Um, and in 2003, um, Wolfowitz visited, uh, this is January 2003, Wolfowitz visited the road construction site and he was concerned that uh, they weren't making much progress. Um, a couple months later, we invaded Iraq. A week later, April 1st of 2003, uh, the National Security Council had told USAID, uh, the president, meaning Bush, of course, had told Karzai, we're getting the road done by the end of the year. They had decided that they would create this um, time frame and this race to get the road paved uh, to show everyone just how quickly we were moving in Afghanistan. Most of the attention, of course, at the time was on uh, Iraq. Of course, we had just invaded Iraq. So uh, the Lewis Berger Group was charged with, they, they huddled up and said, how are we going to get this road um, rebuilt? This wasn't just a simple repaving. The, um, the road was going to be rebuilt with U.S. highway specs, meaning uh, if you know anything about highway building, I know we have... Uh, uh, some highway specialists here. I mean, there's a base level, there's another level, then there's the top layer. So um, 
the Lewis Berger group huddled together and they decided that they would divide the uh, reconstruction into five sections. So um, what further complicated it is the first, um, I believe it was 30, 30 kilometers from Kabul out uh, going uh, uh, south on the, the highway had already been paved by the Taliban. So that just needed repairs. And then the um, 50 kilometers out of Kandahar to uh, 50 kilometers north was being handled by the Japanese in a separate contract. So um, you had about 389 kilometers of the rest of the road that needed to be rebuilt. So the Lewis Berger Group um, hired five subcontractors, three Turkish firms, one Indian firm, and uh, one Afghan firm, which actually had uh, staff in New York. So they had five different subcontractors working on this road. And what was remarkable, and I spent a lot of time in the book talking about this, is they had this massive mobilization. I mean, imagine post-Taliban Afghanistan, 2003. I mean, where, how are you going to build a road when there's no infrastructure, there's no construction companies, there's no supplies. So they did these massive airlifts of construction equipment and supplies and diesel and um, in, the, in the giant uh, Antonov uh, Russian uh, cargo planes. They did 70 of these airlifts and they just had a constant stream of equipment coming in. And then they had to get bitumen, the liquid asphalt, and they had to get it from Egypt and they had to ship it uh, in the Indian Ocean port. Some came through the Khyber Pass. You know, a lot of it was in barrels, so you had huge trucking. So all this was going on in essentially what was a war zone. I mean, this is, again, 2003, Afghanistan. People were getting killed. Um, and you had kidnappings, and a lot of this was covered in the press. And all the while, um, the clock was ticking. And every day, the National Security Council would um, contact AID in Washington and Kabul. How many kilometers have been done? And it literally became <laughs> this race. And so AID would get on Lewis Berger, like, how much, how many kilometers are done? And are you going to make the deadline? And so. Um, at some point, they had to hire a lot more security. Um, it peaked in November of 2003, like 1,100 security drivers. Um, so the end of the story, I mean, the, on one level, it may just sound like a, a boring construction story, but I, I detail in the book the people who actually made this happen on the ground. Um, and so they made the deadline. Um, they, they had the final kilometers paved. Uh, I believe it was December 8th, so they, it was a big celebration, um, and Karzai was there to cut a ribbon. Uh, the AID administrator, um, Natsios, was there. The, the Japanese ambassador to Afghanistan was there, and it was a big deal. However, <laughs> three days before, we had captured Saddam Hussein, so it's this event which probably would have gotten a lot more uh, press, we were sort of upstaged by that event. Uh, so they got the, uh, the blacktop down, and it was considered a, um, a success. And Lewis Berger Group, which hired me to write this book, I mean, they were real straight about it. The, uh, they said from the beginning that the president uh, of Lewis Berger Group, Larry Walker, he said from the very beginning, he said, this is going to be remembered as one of the great civil engineering accomplishments of the 21st century. He's very unapologetic about it. He was straight, and I think he's right. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but it was remarkable that they got this done. Um, so it chronicles that story, um, but on a completely separate level, it was a political story. I mean, the neocons had decided that this was going to make us look good. Um, we want, I, you could argue, well, why did it need to be done by the end of 2003? Well, it really didn't, but it was something that they could say, look, we got it done, look how fast we're going. So on one level it was political. There was another story I didn't write about, which was really a story of turf battles between the Department of Defense and AID, because uh, the Department of Defense was skeptical. Uh, I didn't do a lot of reporting on this, but this is p part of the story. They were skeptical that AID could get this done. 
And so they had people in Kabul who were sort of overshadowing them. Uh, so that was a subtext, a subplot that I didn't write too much about, which uh, is probably a whole nother book. So um, on that level, um, it was a political story. And um, there are a lot of uh, the other side of the story. Um, one of the other um, aspects of the story uh, I did is I profiled people who made it happen. Uh, and there's some very sad stories. A guy from Texas, uh, Mark Humphreys, uh, they, um, he uh, knew somebody from Lewis Berger Group, went over there, uh, was a construction manager in the summer of 2003 while this was going on. Subsequently died in a plane crash in uh, February of 2005. Three kids, um, you know, he would tip the Afghan uh, shoeshine boys five bucks. I mean, everybody loved this guy. And, you know, he just, he's one of the many casualties over there. So I profile him. They set up a foundation for him uh, in his name. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an Afghan-American, this guy is Saeed, who's actually over there now, an engineer who escaped the Soviets in the 70s when they came, got to New York, made his way to California, became a Caltrans engineer, raised three kids, and when this whole accelerated uh, reconstruction, as they called it, was going on, they needed experts. Uh, somehow they got a hold of him. He went over there during this period and helped reconstruct the highway and um, he was a very good source of mine. He subsequently returned to California and then a few years ago he went back again and he's now working on road projects there. Um, the protagonist of the book, it's obviously not fiction, but the sort of the hero of the book, this guy, uh, his name is Jim Myers. Uh, God bless him, he passed away a couple years ago. He was what they call the chief of party. He was the, the boss who over, uh, was uh, overseeing the entire operation. He had worked for Lewis Berger Group, uh, rebuilding uh, Cambodia's major highway, um, uh, Phnom Penh to the seaport. Uh, and he had worked for them in Ethiopia in the mid 70s. We have a picture of him, he, he killed a tiger for the Ethiopian government in 1975. There's this remarkable photo of him from 1975. He looks like um, uh, uh, Indiana Jones, or who's the, uh, the Australian guy? Um, it, it's a re remarkable resemblance. He's holding this, this giant lion, you know, looking up like this. And uh, so he sat, had sort of a legendary quality to him. He was a uh, deep sea diver. He had been known to be in firefights. Um, and so he, the reason he's also central to the story is that after 9-11, Lewis Berger Group knew that there was going to be a massive amount of reconstruction in Afghanistan. And, you know, they were in the, they had a lot of business where they did reconstruction all over the world. So they needed somebody to get to Kabul in the, in the chaos, which, of course, Peter knows as much as anyone, the chaos uh, of post 9-11. So he somehow, he got to Islamabad in December of 2001, and he, I think Christmas Day it was, um, he got a flight with a UN flight to Kabul, and he got there, and one of the first things he did is he was officially charged with um, uh, assessing the damage to the US embassy in Kabul. Um, and because we were, of course, going to reopen the embassy there. And, um, and then after he did that, he decided on his own to do a survey of this major road from Kabul to Mazar-e-Sharif, if I didn't butcher the pronunciation, uh, which includes uh, a trek through, you may have heard of the Salang Tunnel. There's an uh, accident there, I think, in the 70s, one of the worst tunnel accidents or highway accidents ever. But anyhow, he did this... Um, survey report based upon this trip. You know, he hired local Afghans and armed guards, and he went up this road that was very dangerous. And that document uh, got sent back to Washington, and the donor groups who were going to be responsible for reconstruction saw that document, and that helped Lewis Berger establish their presence in Afghanistan and probably helped them get this massive reconstruction contract. So I detail what he did over there and how he set up shop. 
and um, the actual investigation, that this trip that he took. Uh, then he subsequently started to survey all the roads throughout Afghanistan. Because again, Lewis Berger knew that part of this reconstruction, a big part, was going to be rebuilding roads. Um, so then the, the AID got the contract, and as I said, the accelerated um, reconstruction was ordered by the neocons, get it done as quickly as you can. Um, so he's another person that I profiled. Um, there was a young Afghan guy who um, Lewis Berger hired in the fall of 2003 to be a driver and an interpreter. This was the nicest guy in the world. He subsequently, Lewis Berger brought him over here in 2009 and um, paid for his um, education at the Old Dominion University, or somewhere around here. Uh, but anyhow, this guy, um, uh, Tariq, if I uh, remember correctly, he, um, it was very funny, he, would, he was the driver for um, the, the construction people at the Indian subcontractors uh, section. And, and just as a reminder, if, if you look at Kabul to Kandahar, you had like these, uh, 50 to 60 kilometer sections that each of the five subcontractors were um, uh, responsible for. So Tariq was uh, camped out with the Indian subcontractors and he, he wanted to, to practice his English so he had some uh, DVDs and one was of Clint Eastwood's the good, <laughs> the good, you're probably too young to remember, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, from the 60s, which is, you know, was, you know, a classic Clint Eastwood film. And he would practice his English um, at night watching the good, the bad, and the ugly. And this is, you know, there's rocket attacks outside. And, you know, he's in, you know, Afghanistan doing this. And, you know, he'd get up in the morning. He'd drive the construction people where they needed to do, uh, where they needed to go, excuse me. And, um, and then... He did a very good job of what he was doing. So uh, very sad what happened subsequently. I think it was early 2004 when the accelerated part of the project was done. He was uh, somewhere near Kandahar, I believe, um, with uh, some AID people, I believe. This was a horrible story because um, one of the, I think it was an AID engineer who was was shot and almost killed. And uh, anyhow, uh, they were in a helicopter, um, and they were returning to the helicopter after a meeting. And the poor uh, pilot, this Australian guy, uh, out of the blue, some Taliban or militias, who knows, they opened fire and they, they killed the, the, the uh, Australian pilot. And this guy had worked very uh, uh, heavily on the road project. Everybody knew this guy and loved him. So the, the pilot is dead. This AID engineer, this lady is shot and wounded like, and Tariq is standing there and he grabs the, the gun and it's holding off the, um, the shooters um, as he's calling on his cell phone to try to get help. Um, eventually the US military uh, dispatched some jets and he escaped. Um, he was nice, you know, you talk to people who have gone through stuff like this, they typically don't uh, want to talk too much, but he was very, you know, he talked to me about this. So um, he, um, you know, was considered a hero. So Lewis Berger decided, you know, th this is so extraordinary. We're bringing him to the U.S. and we're going to enroll him in uh, Old Dominion. He subsequently went to uh, UC San Diego to get an advanced engineering degree. So I profiled this guy. I think um, the point about these profiles and the book is Lewis Berger Group, probably if you've heard of them, if, if you're not AID or Berger, a lot of what you read about in the media, um, and just, just quickly, the Justice Department settlement that some of you may know about, I, I am not the person to talk to about that, incidentally, but uh, LBG cooperated with the government, put controls in place. It was a result of a misallocation of costs, and that's something, you know, if any of you are interest, interested in that, you just have to talk to uh, LBG. That's completely unrelated to anything that I'm doing here, and, and that's just, that, that's straight. That's, <coughs> excuse me, a separate issue. But Lewis Berger Group, they said, look, this, we want to tell our story. So they hired me. I was an author. I've been a journalist. And we had a very good initial meeting about this. And they said, look, we want to tell our story. You have carte blanche. Talk to anybody you want. I got tons of internal documents, emails, you know, uh, emails 
to the national security folks, uh, Jim Cunder, I don't know if he's there, who um, uh, the, uh, the, the AID guy, uh, I, 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 when I first met him, after doing research, I called him the, the uh, humanitarian go-to guy because he'd been doing this work all over. He was one of the first uh, AID people at the U.S. Embassy in early 2002. Um, all types of internal documents they gave me access to. And they really didn't say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. They, they allowed me to act pretty much as a journalist, even though, yes, they hired me and they paid me to do it. So I thought it was extraordinary in that regard. Um, and uh, it was really telling uh, this particular post-9-11 story from the perspective of a big uh, government contractor that did the work. And, and as I said, they were very proud of having got this done. And so I thought that was a pretty extraordinary uh, part of this whole story is that uh, a government contractor wanted to do the story and they went to the length to do this. Now in terms of, you know, it was a, it's essentially a corporate book so it's not, hasn't been distributed. You can't look it up on Amazon or anywhere. But I thought that was very important. Um, j just to move on, uh, there's a lot of specifics um, a lot of details about this uh, rebuilding campaign from, from uh, basically, let's call it 2003, even though it officially started in, um, uh, I think, the ribbon or, or the, um, the uh, beginning of the construction formally was November of 2002, I believe, and they had a press release from Washington. And, the whole idea, incidentally, the reason this road was so important, needless to say, other than was the major highway, is you can now get people in the villages to um, go get to clinics and hospitals. You would now have commerce. You could have trucks. You could have uh, everything that a highway brings to, in this case, the villages along the stretches of the highway so that they could recover and they could emerge as a bona fide economy and um, and certainly improve their lives in a very general sense from the way things had gone. Uh, in the larger discussion of costs, I mean, that there's a $300 million, there's currently a figure that for roads built in Afghanistan, including security, including everything, it's essentially going to cost you a million dollars per kilometer. Now, the folks here who are in the trenches of this, after if, if there are, in, uh, you know, people interested in, well, how do you calculate that, they co probably could <laughs> answer it better than me. But the price tag for this particular project, Kabul to Kandahar, including the Japanese section, and also excluding the first 25 kilometers out of Kabul that were only repaired. The whole uh, project, including the, the final work in 2004, which included another layer of asphalt and signs, and in some cases they, they widened the road to uh, accommodate villagers who said, could you make it a little wider, whatever it might be. Uh, five bridges that they also um, constructed, and yes, I don't know if all of them have been destroyed, were destroyed subsequently, but some of them, $300 million. Th this is the, the basic number, $261 million of U.S. taxpayer dollars, and the Japanese, it cost them about $39 million for their section. So those are the numbers in terms of what the, the costs were, were. Now, where we are now, um, there's a, um, a road that they completed. Uh, it is interesting the way this road was done. I don't know a lot about it, but USAID hired Lewis Berger Group. Uh, it's a road to Faze, <coughs> excuse me, Fazebad, if I pronounced it right. Um, 100 kilometers. Um, Lewis Berger Group subbed it out to a South Korean firm. Um, they were the project managers, and then the South Korean firm, uh, as needed, subbed it out to locals to get diesel, to get fuel, whatever uh, the needs were. And that was completed in December of 2010. 
100 kilometers, about $100 million. And Karzai did not show up for the ribbon cutting. So <laughs> the, the celebration was canceled. Just a little aside there. Um, so in terms of infrastructure, tens of billions spent over the last 10 years, um, where we're at now. I think what's very important now is, a lot of you probably know, the, the Special Inspector General John Sopko was just appointed. I don't know if you've gone, CIGAR is the acronym. Um, he's gotten his marching orders to be very aggressive in investigations into fraud and waste. Uh, not that it hadn't been vigorous, but um, from what I understand, this is one of the few times where it's a, a special uh, inspector general just for one country. So he's gotten his marching orders to be very aggressive uh, to go after fraud and waste. And there's about $36 billion uh, of money that has been targeted for uh, reconstruction in Afghanistan, which hasn't been actually spent yet. And so the question is, well, how much of that will be blocked because of uh, the investigations that are going on? Also, I believe the uh, Obama administration currently has in the current budget uh, 9 to 10 billion more. So are we going to continue to see more infrastructure development at the same level or will it be curtailed? And of course, we're looking at a situation where we're leaving, we're turning over the, uh, the operation there to the, the Afghans um, and how that's going to, um, how that's going to affect the uh, reconstruction. Um, in terms of what we've actually gotten, and remember the World Bank, the U.S. has been the primary uh, investor. Um, I think it's something like 89 billion minus that 36 billion. But the World Bank has been a major investor and some other, uh, Japan as I had mentioned, and some other donor countries. Um, but you know, 90 schools approximately, um, many roads, you know, obviously I've been talking about this major road. And incidentally, um, Louis Berger also got the contract to do the road, which was built by the Soviets uh, in the 50s and 60s, a concrete road from Kandahar to Herat. Um, and they subsequently, I think they completed that in 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. So um, there's been a lot of road building there. And again, um, what to me is of interest is that uh, a skeptic might say, well, why do we have to build these roads to the highest specs in the world, um, U.S. highway spec building? Um, we could save a heck of a lot. And I, don't, I, I don't really know. I'm just, that, that's playing the devil's advocate. Some people might ask that. Um, there's been clinics. There's been agricultural uh, programs. Of course, there's been what have <laughs> been labeled as boondoggles at the Kajaki, Kajaki, excuse me, dam, which um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that's another AID project. Initially, what happened is there were two turbines there. If you know anything about hydroelectric dams and generating systems, there were two turbines in place and they were rotted out or whatever. AID hired uh, LBG, Lewis Berger Group to get them up and running. And they, in 2003, 2004, 2005, they did that. And they increased the electricity uh, production from, I think, 10 megawatts to 30, to about 30. And so they did increase electricity initially. Then there was this campaign to bring a third turbine from, made in China, and it was a remarkable logistical um, operation, and I believe the British were heavily involved to get the turbine to the plant. And they got it there, and then it was like dead in the water because they couldn't get the final concrete and other materials there because of security. So then it's just been sitting there. So there's been a lot of press about that, like, why did you go to through all of this and, and then it's just sitting there? I think the BBC, I don't know, the, the latest I saw was a few years ago, a BBC reporter was there and this third turbine is just sitting there in pieces. So you have projects like that. There's been a lot of criticism about that. There's a, a Dole Fruits, as in Dole Fruits and Vegetables here, uh, 
I don't know where they're based in the U.S. They were supposed to uh, build a plant somewhere near Mazar al-Sharif and uh, a whole agricultural um, program where they were going to grow fruits and vegetables, and that never panned out. That was, I think, started in 2005. Uh, so there's been... Um, projects that have worked, projects that haven't. And of course, this has all been going on in the context of the war on terror and what has been going on in Afghanistan uh, since 2002. I mean, there's been volumes written about it. So the, the idea of infrastructure development there, what have we gotten for it? If you go to AID's website, for instance, um, they have a dedicated website um, to the work they've done in Afghanistan. Now, you, it might be, a, a, you know, uh, out of date, some of it, but they have a lot of details about projects that they're very proud of that they've done. And you might, you know, a reporter might investigate and say, yeah, you did, you, you brought water to this village, but right now the Taliban just came in and wiped it out, whatever it might be. But the point is there's dozens and dozens of these projects that have been completed. Um, and that's essentially where the tens of billions of dollars have been spent. And so you could, the schools, uh, for instance, I, I mean, you could argue under the Taliban and, and the way they treated women and children, that's been heavily, you know, chronicled many, many books. But, you know, kids are going to school. In September of 2002, as quickly as that, um, AID had opened, there's a great picture in the book, I'm sorry I'm promoting that, but great picture in the book from September of 2002, uh, one of the a AID administrators, Fred Shake, is there at this, um, I'm going to show you the picture, at um, this, they just reopened a kindergarten daycare center. This is September of 2002. Imagine a year ago what's going on in that country. I'm not suggesting, you know, this is Pollyanna, but to me that, and here's the picture, I mean, you can see, I mean, this is September of 2002. And look at these, these, these beautiful little kids and look at the dress. And here's this, you know, AID administrator. And this post-Taliban Afghanistan, you know, a year after 9-11. So you could say, well, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Um, and so there's been a lot of, of good stuff. Women's rights. I mean, there's been a lot about you know, women voting and uh, the university in Kabul. I mean, there's a dedicated association uh, here in Washington um, which uh, focuses on uh, this particular university. I mean, they have a soccer field that used to be a minefield. And incidentally, um, um, I don't want to go too much longer. We can open it up. Um, there's an entire, I, sh I should have mentioned, there's an entire chapter in the book on demining. That's another, I mean, you probably know Afghanistan per, per square mile had more landmines and unexploded ordnance like bombs that didn't go off, RPGs, tank shells, than any country in the world. So a part, of, the other thing that made this pretty remarkable, one of the other things completing this uh, highway is they, they had to demine the entire section. They brought special dogs in from South Africa because there was this special demining process and technology they had in a company called Mechem from South Africa. You know, so they, while this is all going on, they're demining. Um, and there's a remarkable picture also of these Afghan deminers. I think six of them, every one of them has lost a limb. They're back working with prosthetics. They, they look like a band of brothers. They're smile. It's one of the most remarkable images I've ever seen. Um, and so, um, you know, they, there, had been, there had been a lot of demining going on. I mean, the United Nations had an extremely active demining program going on at least in the, the 90s, but probably not during the, um, somebody might, speak to this more authoritatively, but maybe not during the Soviet war. But so there was a very, it was, a, it was an industry essentially, you know, demining the, the place was just littered. I mean, the amputees were all over the place. So um, that was another aspect of this um, accomplishment, how they uh, demined the roads and the environs um, while excavating, digging up, bringing gravel to sites and, you know, bulldozers, excuse me. Um, so I wanted also to add that. So 
just to wrap things up, um, I think we can, you know, talk more about um, this particular project. I'm sure you might have questions um, about the dynamics of uh, the actual work that was done, the people involved, and the political side. Uh, and then where are we now? You know, October 2012. Is this special, and maybe I'm um, thinking that SOPCO's investigations may not be that uh, um, relevant to the work that's going on? I don't know. I mean, if you look, uh, if you look at his most recent report, July 30th, I believe it is, 200-page document, it's a heck of a lot going on. And his, his next one, he's testifying, you know, uh, in front of a Congress a lot. This next one will be out in two weeks. So how is that going to affect the, these, the, this massive, uh, call it $36 billion, that has been targeted but hasn't been spent yet? So I think that's very important. But the, the story, I, I just think of all the post-9-11 stories, I mean, hundreds of them, you know, ranging from the, the, the horror of the collapse of the Twin Towers to the Pentagon to the movies, and it's just a massive amount of stories. This is a forgotten one that has its own position in history in the annals of civil engineering, and I think also in the annals of, call it nation building, and also the U.S. response to 9-11 because as we know, the, the strategy was invade Iraq, but at the same time, w we wanted to rebuild Afghanistan, not just rebuild it. I mean, this was the country that harbored the folks who, t excuse me, the, the, the people who took down, who, who committed the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack, and we'll never let that happen again. So we're going to rebuild the country uh, in a massive effort um, in every, and, and it was basically uh, with a budget that was uh, unlimited. It's like roads, it, the com completely rebuild the country. So I think in that, uh, in that regard, it, it's an important post-9-11 story on all those different levels. So I, I'll just leave it at that. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, presentation. This, this is not really a question, but more of a comment. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, the demining because, you know, that's one of the things that um, when you go to Afghanistan, if you went to Afghanistan for the first three or four years after 9-11, there were deminers everywhere. And now you almost never see them. I mean, the country has been largely demined. And that's something I think that people tend to sort of forget. I mean, it's... it's um, you know, I, I traveled down that road under the Taliban um, when it was, before it was obviously uh, reconstructed, and it was a 17-hour drive um, without any stops. Uh, and I've taken the road subsequently, and it's been about seven hours. I mean, I guess the big difference now is that it's almost too dangerous in certain parts to take the road. I mean, certainly, I mean, even in 2006, it became dangerous to take the road north of Ghazni. Um, and I don't think that has changed very much. Anyway, I'd like to open it up to uh, questions. If you, can, if you have a question, just identify yourself. And uh, David Isby. Uh, yes. uh, just say, I, well, I've only written on parts of this road in Ghazni and Wardak province in recent years. Uh, the Af it appeared to me in the Afghan said that uh, if it's built to U.S. standards, uh, they've deteriorated rather dramatically from when they built the roads uh, in southern Afghanistan in the 1960s. Uh, the roads I saw of that area, now I'm sure none of this is done by military convoys, but uh, they look to be in pretty bad shape compared to things like I've seen in Afghanistan in the 1980s. How did you go, uh, what, how do you deal in your book? I realize as an official historian this is an issue. How do you deal with this obvious quality control issue? Well, I, I wrote uh, primarily about the road building in 2002 and 2003 from uh, Kabul to Kandahar. And at that time, the actual um, reconstruction, uh, the road was in very good shape. Um, I mean, 
uh, obviously wasn't there. You have one of my sources, uh, David Lee Anderson, John, I'm sorry, John Lee Anderson, he did, did a piece for The New Yorker, uh, and I called him up, and he said, I believe it was 2005, he said, it was a great, I felt like I was in the uh, U.S. Southwest, cruising down the road. Uh, again, I think it's a separate, so in other words, the road was built according to these U.S. highway specs, and it was a very good road. Um, I think there were, uh, the Japanese section, as I understand it, it took them a while to, to finish that, the 50 kilometers from Kandahar north. But I think th there's two separate issues. Maybe you could speak to this. And, and one is the, I'm sorry. Have you actually seen this road to Rollabout Surges? I'm sorry, can I ask you that? Have you actually seen the road? I haven't been on the road. No, I wrote the book in 2009 and 2010. And the book is about what happened in two, from 9-11 through 2003. Now, subsequently, I didn't write, um, I didn't, uh, it really wasn't part of this book in terms of, well, subsequently, you know, uh, the roads become a gauntlet. I mean, CNN, what was it, two years ago, you can Google this, and uh, they talk about illegal checkpoints um, and people getting killed. Now, in terms of the, the road deteriorating, we know uh, in 2009, when I, um, January, February 2009, when I first started the book, there were some emails from some very angry AID Berger people who talked about the bridges had just been blown up. Can't we get enough security to, we spent all this time rebuilding these bridges, and can't we get security to protect it? So in terms of the deteriorating condition that you came across, I don't have expertise on that. I defer to you and anyone else who's been there, um, but from 2001 to 2003, I relied on my sources um, in terms of the condition of the road and, you know, including journalists like the guy I mentioned, John Lee Anderson, who drove on the road. Um, and it, there was another, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah. we'll ask this question here. Dan Whitman with American University. I think the story you tell us indeed is unknown to many of us. It is an inspiring story. You yourself referred to the many books that have been written on related topics. If this is an unfair uh, tangent, please let me know, but uh, one of the other recent books about uh, construction in Afghanistan, of course, is Rajiv Chandra Sekhar's Little America. Is it fair? to even ask this question in this setting, um, uh, whether you're familiar with that, that darker side where the argument is made contrary to your very believable story that the, uh, of an earlier period, post-World War II, uh, that the American civil engineers who went and worked on an irrigation project, bringing water from the south to the north, in fact were very insulated, very, not, very much not in contact with uh, Afghan society. I think your story is quite the reverse. Do you have any comment about this? Can, can a mutually believed reality include both versions? Yeah, I think the answer is it's a completely different world now. And um, the mobilization that uh, ensued when they said, when they got the marching orders that we have to get this road done by the end of the year was remarkable. You, it was a, a global turnout, and I think it really showed the effects of globalization in a post-Soviet world. So, yes, you had Americans and Australians and Canadians working side by side with Afghans and um, Indians and Brits, and, and so it was truly a global um, uh, effort. And it, so in ter I, don't, I know a little bit about the early work uh, in the early 60s when the Army Corps got the contract to build this highway. I mean, it had been an ancient route going back to, you know, the Silk uh, Road trade. I mean, you know, thousands of years. So there had been some road there. But the Army Corps, um, I, I write about this briefly in the beginning, they were charged with creating this 
highway from Kabul to Kandahar, and I talked to one of the guys, um, you probably know him, Thomas Gutierre, if I pronounced it correctly. He's um, Afghan center, is it Nebraska? He was there in 60, the mid-60s as a Peace Corps volunteer, and I talked to him, and he said, yeah, this was a huge deal. He got bussed down by AID, was AID, yeah, AID had been formed in what, 61, by AID to the um, ribbon cutting this is July of 1966, because they wanted this to be a big deal, um, because the Soviets were very aggressive in Afghanistan with their own construction projects, um, including the, the highway from Kandahar to Herat. So at the time, I don't really know. I mean, you, you have a lot more expertise in terms of uh, the, the mindset of Americans and their interaction with Afghans. All I know in this case here, it wasn't even an issue. This was really a lot of the expats, expats who went, obviously it was a financial interest. Um, there's war, you know, uh, danger pay and everything. They, this was post 9-11. They wanted to contribute to the war on terror. Uh, I think Mark Humphreys, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the poor guy from Texas, um, who was killed in the plane crash. I think that's a good example. You know, they were very, and I talked with his brother who also dispatched, and yeah, they were, they were very much, um, they wanted to contribute to the war on terror, and, and there was no consideration. I mean, I can't get inside people's heads, but just, uh, and this was a way, this was a way to do it. Uh, we have a, just uh, very quickly, uh, my apologies, uh, we have a, a map of uh, the actual mobilization of people and equipment to Afghanistan. And it just shows you how, I mean, there are people from Latin America, Australia, and I should know where this is. But I'm Hooker? sorry, go ahead. There's another question here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is uh, Larry Cohen. I'm former Foreign Service Officer. I was in Afghanistan uh, when this road was uh, under construction back in 2003. Mm -hmm. At the time, our impression was, by the way, far more than $300 million, but I, don't, I certainly don't know what the final cost was. But at the time, our impression was that this was the most expensive two-lane road ever constructed, and that uh, uh, it was constructed as a two-lane road, and at the end, in order to get completed by December, it became somewhat of a pie crust road, which given Afghan vehicles means that it would break down quite, quite rapidly. There are other parts of the ring road that were built by the, the Soviets that are still in better shape now than I think the Kabul, the Kandahar road has become. Also, I, I think your uh, um, uh, analogy with the uh, South Koreans in building a road in Faizabad is probably not a good one because Faizabad is in Badakhshan and uh, the, the geography is quite a bit different than the, than the Chaman fault line, which runs south from Kabul towards Kandahar. So it would have been a lot more expensive for the South Koreans to build a, a road up where they were building it. Um, and finally, uh, frankly, the security issue, it was great to get this done, but it was a terrific mistake to think that all we needed to do as the U.S. government was to complete a road by a certain date and, and wrap it up, wipe our hands, and then you know, kind of forget about the rest of the infrastructure because we really haven't done very much since the completion of the Ring Road to Herat about this major infrastructure of uh, highways, especially uh, north of Kabul through the Salong Tunnel, which is a complete mess. Mm -hmm. where, where specifically in 2003 was the road not built um, as a continuous blacktop that you talk about? What, what section of the road? Pie crust, or it was, yeah. ru it was rushed at the very end in order to get mm -hmm. a completion date uh, to meet their target. It was rushed at the end. I have no idea but, where. But rushed, but yeah. and as a result of being rushed, and also simply, was, uh, simply when you said U.S. specs, and I think that I probably would agree with what this gentleman said, U.S. specs perhaps for a two-lane road, but certainly not U.S. specs for say an interstate highway, and uh, you can't really compare uh, the ring road to um, you know, a U.S. highway by any means. No, I think what's important is that wherever these sections were that were uh, not uh, at uh, quality levels, 
um, again, I was writing, uh, no one mentioned that to me in my research. Um, and uh, there's two issues. One, so specifically, if you were to say, like, at kilometer 79, the, there was a pothole that they never filled, whatever it might be, then we could say, okay, they blew it, they fudged it, it really wasn't completed, and therefore the whole thing was not legitimate. The other issue I think you could talk forever in terms of well, why did you need to set this completion date by the end of 2003? What was the significance? And as it was a political um, decision. It, it, for whatever reason, this whole ribbon cutting, it, uh, three days after Saddam Hussein was captured, it was a big deal politically. It's like, we got it done, everybody. See, so, uh, you know, in terms of that, I've heard that criticism before. I don't address it in the book because uh, that's really not what this book is about. It's how they, how they got it done. I would be very interested in knowing um, specifically where these apparent gaps in quality were throughout this 389 kilometers that Berger was charged with um, paving. I think one of the things was the idea to get a single layer black top down. They had to, uh, and again, they, there's even a diagram of, you know, uh, of the uh, actual specs, and we have an engineer here if you want to speak to this. Um, th this was the actual spec um, and the schematic, you know, they had the base level and then this, and this is what they worked from. Um, but the, the actual asphalt layer, at times when they were racing against the clock, they, they didn't think they could get in some of the areas, like it was getting cold in um, some of the, the areas um, that were higher elevation, they were worried about whether they could get the blacktop down. So they were uh, discussing possibly using uh, just a uh, double bituminous, if I remember correctly, um, but by, and also uh, bitumen shipments. I mean, a big part of this with the clock ticking is that are we going to get enough bitumen, liquid asphalt in? You know, what's going on with the caravans coming from Karachi? You know, is this going to, can we make it? So, but they, um, uh, you know, unless they're specific, no one's come forward. I mean, you're the first person to come forward. I haven't talked a lot about this since it was completed. But if there were specific uh, kilometers or areas. Well, I, I don't want to you know, belittle the point, obviously, mm -hmm. but you didn't develop, the road was not designed for overweight Afghan trucks. And so, whether it was by U.S. specs or using by human, it clearly was going to break down. The lady over here. Thank you, and thank you, uh, David, very much for this presentation, for bringing this up again. Uh, my name is Judy Benjamin, and I'm a consultant. And I was at the December 8th ribbon cutting when the road was open, and spent, has spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. But I think that the political issue here, it's clearly was a political, getting it done and getting it done on time. But all you have to do is drive down I-95 and get the idea that you can build the finest road with the best materials <laughs> in our country, and if you don't maintain them and yeah. keep them maintained, they will not last. So I think it's a ludicrous discussion in some ways to talk about the poor quality of the road falling apart when, and then this is again goes back to a political issue. If you're going to give the money to build a road or to build any infra infrastructure in these countries, the, you, there has to be a maintenance plan with it. And while I think the USAID did try to build up the capacity of the Ministry of Transportation and roads and give them some funding and give them some training and, in fact, even give them some of the equipment that was used to construct the road, when you have the security issue has fallen apart and people can't safely travel on the road, let alone maintain it, and they still do not have the capacity to do that nor the funds to do it, I mean let go of your expectations that this is going to be a, a super wonderful highway forever. It, it just isn't. And so I think that we have to think about in international development where we're spending our money, which I think this is what this kind of review of, of your book is, um, how do we spend money and get good value long term out of it and, you know, build capacity. I think that's, you know, would, would be our interest uh, to carry on with it. But Great points. Any other questions? Thank you, Xavier. As I understand it, 
Lewis Berger subcontracted. Uh, Lewis Berger subcontracted out the work to uh, maybe Southeast Asian firms or other firms, non-American firms. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, three Turkish firms, an Indian firm, and th the fifth firm was an Afghanistan firm, although they had representatives in New York. So it might have been difficult for these firms to build roads to American specs, but beyond that, do you have any information as to how much profit Lewis Berger made on this, I guess probably for them, 270 million plus deal? I have no idea in terms of what their margins were at all. That was not part of the discussion at all. Um, they're obviously, they're a profit-making company. Um, and they, their profit margin, I don't know. Ahmed Al-Fai, Ripper Consultant. Uh, the question I have for you is, uh, how did uh, Lewis Berger act? Did they act as a design engineer? a consulting engineer, a construction manager, or a general contractor? Well, they acted first and foremost as the project manager. They received the contract from USAID. Contract for design or design and construction? Design and construction. So they were general contractors? Yes, and then they subsequently subbed it out. Yes, yes. Yes, but Lewis Berger worked, the, Lewis Berger's staff worked hand in hand with the subcontractors. Um, they had a meeting, for instance, in May of 2003, after the AID said, you have to get this road done by the end of the year, they had uh, three or four of the contractors come to Washington and they laid out a plan like, how are we going to do this? Okay, we're going to divide the, the, the 389 kilometers into five sections. You get this, you get this, you get this. Um, where are you going to get your bitumen from? Where are you going to get your vehicles from? How are you going to do this? And then it was like a weekend, and I write about this. Um, it was like a weekend, you know, 24-7 session. They hold up at one of the hotels around here. And so the answer to your question is they were the... Um, uh, contract, uh, the, the project managers, and the general contractor. Um, and they subbed it out. And, and that's what I write about here in terms of, uh, and, and incidentally, the, the firms that were hired, um, one of them, um, Galson Shukurova, if I <laughs> pronounced it correctly, I met with their officials in Istanbul as part of the research. Um, they, for, they had a caravan of trucks carrying 30 of their dump trucks from Turkey through Iran into Afghanistan. I mean, just to show you part of the logistics here, they base, base we have pictures of it here, they, well, we need a lot of dump trucks. So they just, you know, they got the, the contract from Berger and they um, mobilized all these dump trucks, um, you know, in a week or so across Iran, and then, um, but yes, th the answer to your question is yes, they, they had those different roles, Lewis Berger Group. Um, I'm Joel Jager from American University. My question is uh, whether in your research you looked at all into how uh, Afghans in the region viewed the project, uh, was there any indication that, that they were generally positive towards it, or was there any skepticism about uh, U.S. intentions? Well, some Afghans embraced it because the laborers, for instance, they were looking for work, and Lewis Berger Group paid them in dollars. They literally got, it was a cash business at that level. They got U.S. dollars from banks in uh, Dubai, and there was a Crown Agents facility in Kabul. So for uh, Afghans looking for work, uh, I, I don't know what the daily wage was. I mean, these would be truck drivers, uh, laborers at the asphalt plants. They looked at it as uh, very positive. I'm sure there were some Afghan. I mean, you would could speak to this better than than um, I can. Uh, it was yet another foreign presence in there, and 
here we go again. You know, we're skeptical and we don't want them here. Um, for those, for some, it was a curiosity. It's like, look at this massive assemblage of of asphalt plants and bulldozers and all these people from all over the world rebuilding this this road. So, um, I don't. Of course, there were killings and kidnappings, and at the time, who the folks were who were doing these crimes, I don't know. Again, I would defer to Peter on this. So, uh, I believe it was 30 people killed. Um, I don't know, a dozen kidnapped. So it was a war zone, essentially. So you had some local Afghans, I'm sure, who were part of, you know, who may have sympathized with uh, the uh, militias who were doing the killings and the kidnappings. Um, but um, you had, the, I think first and foremost, you did have Afghans uh, who were glad that it, um, gave them employment. Now, Tariq, the driver I told you about, obviously this, this young guy was very happy. He, he got a job. He, I think he had been working for the United Nations, but you know, he got a, a job driving and interpreting. And for him, it was a very uh, positive thing. My name is Elizabeth Cutler and I work for DAI. And um, going back on, off of the, the previous question though, is did LBJ and or USAID implement any kind of public outreach campaign to the general public about what this road was about so that the message was more than how it benefited people financially who were actually working on it, but how it would actually was supposed to benefit all Afghans and not just ones employed on the project? I think at the time, uh, AID um, handled most of the press relations, um, and uh, Lewis Berger had their own uh, communications going out. I don't know how, how aggressive they were in trying to get the word out. Um, I do think, again, a, since it was an AID project and Lewis Berger was the contractor, I think they probably deferred to um, uh, AID, but the fact they contracted me to do this book, now it was several years later, I think, to tell the story of how they got it done, including how it benefited Afghans in general, I don't think you could say, I mean, to be honest, it didn't benefit all Afghans, you know? I mean, how could it possibly benefit all in a, such a complex situation. The, the bottom line uh, rationale was that the major highway from Kabul to Kandahar being opened and paved and made uh, so you could travel it very freely um, could only benefit the Afghan economy, people again who needed to, to, villagers who needed to get from point A to point B, say to a, a hospital or a clinic, or just truck drivers who needed to ship uh, commodities from point A to point B. But in terms of how it benefited all Afghans, I don't think you could say that it did. I mean, how, how could you make that uh, assertion? Okay, well, thank you for that, and we'd like to thank Xavier for his presentation, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.